in the beginning it was really it took me a long time to come to terms with there was no why did I get this that's I think when somebody's first diagnosed is probably one of the hardest things like why what did I do what did I do So would have been the beginning of February of 2012, probably around February of 2012, I started having this really bad pain in my right hip. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And I went to my primary care physician and she took blood tests and she took some x-rays and did all kinds of tests and you know didn't find anything. So we just kept digging further and further. Um, sending me to a orthopedic surgeon to do a spine x-ray. He's the one that suggested I get an MRI and the MRI is what revealed lytic lesions where if, in myeloma, for those of you who know myeloma, it, it tends to uh, create lytic lesions. It creates holes in your bones because the Myeloma is a cancer of the bone marrow, so it's eating away at the insides of your bones. <laughs> and uh, revealed the lytic lesion still wasn't a confirmation diagnosis. So she, my primary care physician, referred me to a hematologist oncologist who did a bone marrow biopsy, and that confirmed that I had myeloma. Even before, when he had the lesions, he wasn't sure it was myeloma, but he did. So literally between, um, so it was from February, somewhere in the mid-February to the end of June. That's how long it took to get a real diagnosis. In the meantime, my pain kept getting worse and worse. I was using a cane. I was on pain pills. It was really frustrating <laughs> to not know what was going on. In a period of about three to four months, she went from someone who was going to curves once a week and working out there to someone who could not walk on level ground without a cane. So not good. Yeah, we just didn't know what was going on. I had to, uh, I, you know, I remember once talking to a coworker who saw me walking from the parking lot. I was working down the peninsula at the time and you know, with the cane and she thought, oh my God, you look so awful. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I said, yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get it. And, um, you know, I did. So it was, it was, it was rough, but I guess I just kept going. There always seemed to be some other blood tests. I mean, I think I probably had like six or seven panels of different kinds of blood panels to try to figure out what was going on. So yes, this is my fun story. <clears throat> I had an appointment set up in the end of June with my, um, primary care physician who I'd gone to, I'd seen several times since February to try to figure out what was going on. And the day before my appointment with the primary care physician, I get this referral email from the doctor's office referring me to an oncologist hematologist. And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> and I think I was in denial <laughs> as to what that really meant. I was like, okay, I'll just wait till I go see the doctor tomorrow. But it was pretty shocking. Uh, so I went to the doctor and I talked to my doctor and she, um, you know, she told me what was going on and, you know, she explained to me why. And then, you know, she excused herself for a minute and she went to the person who was a junior person in the office and I could hear her like, kind of reading her the riot act for sending that email to me ahead of time. So that was, that was pretty weird. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I found out that I probably had cancer, but I didn't really know much about the disease. So they had set up an appointment with the hematologist oncologist for me to talk to. And he, he was a lovely man, lovely, lovely man. And, um, was very good and there I got one of my first fun and exciting bone marrow biopsies 
<laughs> figure this, spend a whole hour on those. But, um, and the bone marrow biopsy at the end of June, um, that's what confirmed that I had multiple myeloma. And then he said, as far as survival is concerned, five years is easy. And that thumping sound was my jaw dropping through three floors of the medical building, excuse me. I mean, Teresa got the shock. I mean, I'd always been healthy, uh, you know, pretty much, and didn't have anything wrong with me, specifically nothing to, nothing to say that, oh, you're gonna get cancer, led a fairly healthy lifestyle um, while enjoying it. But I, so I was shocked to get this diagnosis. I knew what it meant for her and that was gonna be a big part of her life from here on out. And that also is gonna be a big part of my life from here on out. It took me a while to absorb it all. I didn't like totally freak out or, or um, you know, I think I still had a little of that denial. I mean, it just took a while and I, and I kind of wanted to, I remember when they talked about setting up appointments for uh, first treatments, you know, I thought, well, maybe we'll wait a few weeks. It goes, why are we waiting? We should do this right away. And you, so I think I didn't really get the impact of it um, right away. It, it was kind of gradual. It wasn't, it wasn't a one, like, boom, it hit me. It just kind of gradually, as I talked to them, as I did more research, as I then, you know, got real information about what the treatment was going to be and did some more research that it just kind of slowly seeped in that um yeah i've got cancer and it's it's not the worst cancer but it's not good because it doesn't have a cure so that was that was uh that was a little shocking <laughs> yeah so that that was a confirmation i came back the next week with tom my husband and he very patiently and thoroughly went through what this disease was, went through the treatment protocols and you know what we would do next. But one thing that has been really, really good is because it's been so long, they've developed new therapies and we became like the in cancer to have a therapy for. So we've gotten, a lot of new things. The oncologist had a very specific treatment plan. He goes, this is kind of the, this is the initial treatment that you get for this, which is RVD, you hear a lot, Revlimid, um, Velcade, and Dexamethasone. And he says, this is the standard of care, this is the best that we can do for you. So there wasn't really, at that time, there wasn't really a good alternative this was the best alternative and that's what he said so I'm like okay you know we'll go with that and and you know Tom and I just talked about it and and one thing that I appreciate he always says is you know it's it's your body <laughs> you know you you kind of have to make the ultimate decision but but obviously over the years we've talked about different treatments and different treatment plans and what it's going to involve and kind of timing and everything but in the beginning the timing was um just as soon as possible um it was effective it was effective i um i think i had gotten i had had a fever and i got went into my second infusion appointment and the fever got worse and i did worse and I, they took me right up to the hospital, which was, at the time I was doing it at CPMC. That was my first hospital stay, just uh, after my second infusion. And then, um, but it was just overnight for observation and they checked and I was okay. So it, it's just the shock to your body. So this is kind of interesting and, and I've thought about it over time is that it tends to when you start a new therapy, your body tends to be shocked and you often have the adverse reactions. Luckily, um, I didn't have them continued. So my first reactions were kind of itching and 
A um, couple months later, I kind of had a little rash, but it went away. It was nothing really um, awful, just fatigue, but I, I did have a lot of fatigue. And I wasn't sure if I was going to take time off of work. Um, you know, I took time off for all the appointments and everything, but after that, I decided, yeah, I think I really do need to take a few months off. You know, I'm hard headed. And um, so I, I think shortly after that, decided, yeah, that I needed to take a leave of absence from work. So I took like a three month leave of absence. And um, so that was a good thing. But it made, yeah, so, yeah, so that's sort of the first. And then after about six months, my numbers went low. So I have IgG kappa light chain myeloma. There are about 12 different kinds of myeloma, which make it such a fun and exciting disease because it's so varied that it's hard to pinpoint sometimes for people. And what works for one person doesn't work for the next person, I found out. Um, so uh, it worked and I was off treatment for a while and then I went back on treatment and then off and back. So it just, so if I could character, maybe that's my, my, my summary of my story is it's uh, been on a roller coaster ever since of, of, of going up and down and having longer stretches of relapse or shorter stretches of relapse, depending on what's going on. And I've gotten upset a lot during obviously these 10 years uh, was when I didn't have control and, 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 and I guess that's what affected me more than the why was that I don't have any control over this in my body. I, I can do what I can do, but I can't control this disease. I can't control the effects of the treatment so much and, and, and even subconsciously things that I was doing um, were often because I couldn't control this part of my life. Um, I became refractory towards my line of treatment, at, which at that time was daratumumab and probably something else I don't remember. I'm sure Dex again, but um, uh, daratumumab and it stopped working. And they had a trial available, and he thought I was a good candidate. And, you know, and I asked him why he thought I was a good candidate. He goes, well, you know, you're, you're in otherwise pretty good shape. You're doing well. You know, I know you pay attention, you know, carrying your, your, your notebook. I know I'm somebody that cares. I ask questions. I follow orders. <laughs> so he thought I would be a very good candidate for the CAR-T trial. So I was very, I'm very proud to say that I was in the BB2121 trial, which led to the very first FDA approved CAR T cell treatments. Clinical trials are, are a lot, and you have to be dedicated. And as a matter of fact, I remember talking to somebody who said, you know, why, why are you doing this trial? And I said, well, you know, I wanna help other people. Besides, I think it's gonna help me. It sounds really good and, and it, you know, it's gonna help me. And she goes, you're much more altruistic than I am. <laughs> you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Anyway, so I had been reading about car -Ts and I'd heard that they just had amazing, amazing results. People thought that this might be the cure for myeloma that everybody's been frantically searching for. So, um, it seemed like a good idea at the time uh, it was a lot to go through, 55 pages of study material that you had to sign your name about 20 some odd times to, so it's, it is a lot to go through a clinical trial, but it's so worth it. And I guess I, I trusted my doctor, so I, luckily when I switched over to C, UCSF, um, my doctor's Dr. Thomas Martin, who is a world renowned myeloma specialist and I trusted his opinion and read everything and uh, I did have some hesitation because it was still a trial but it was it was sort of a 
you know, the end of the trial, so the safety and efficacy had been already dealt with, and this was just a matter of figuring out dosage, I believe. So it wasn't, it wasn't a scary trial. So there were three days of uh, chemo that you had to go into before the CAR-T and to get the CAR-T you have to go in the hospital and getting the CAR-T is actually, you know, it's like, you know, a short infusion. It's like not that big of a deal. You go through all this stuff and the actual getting them, I mean, you know, sort of expect should be fireworks or something, but no, it's just, you know, it's a little squish and you get CAR-T cells. So. <laughs> And um, so we had, so I got them on a Monday, and then we had what we like to call Loopy Tuesday. <laughs> so I did have the cytokine release uh, syndrome, and I do not remember that most of that day at all. <laughs> I said some strange things when they asked me the questions, and. But after that, they hooked me up. They hooked me. They 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 did so many things to make sure I was okay. I I mean I felt okay. I mean they had they did tests. They had the doctors come every five minutes. They wouldn't leave me alone. Um, then they you know they hooked my head up to I don't know what what is it? they take the brain waves at you, and so then we played like I was somehow controlling the universe with my brain and did that. <laughs> And, oh God, they took pictures and everything, but everything was fine. So I didn't really, except for that maybe 12, 18 hour stretch, um, it was otherwise being bored in the hospital. <laughs> Luckily I had, an, you know, within 30 days, I had a complete response. No, uh, no myeloma in my system was detected and that lasted for about 18 months. Um, which is better than the average, which was about a year or 13 months. So I, I, I beat the odds, but um, it came back. And so we just, we talked about options and uh, actually I did go on, uh, I didn't actually go on treatment right away. And after a month, Dr. Martin said, oh, well, I've got another CAR-T trial we could try. It's got a little bit of a different target, so maybe it'll work. And, you know, these are the things that they're learning. I mean, CAR-T trials are new. They don't know if another CAR-T is going to work. So I stopped that trial, went on the CAR-T trial, the second CAR-T trial, and that I didn't have as bad, I did not have the bad um, CRS situation that I had on the first one, but it went, uh, it only gave me remission for like three months, so it wasn't really effective. So that's when we decided to go on Selenexor. So we have, I, um, so I'm taking, it's Selenexor in combination with Carfilzomib, so, and Dexamethasone. So I take in the beginning, it was three weeks on and one week off of Selenexor. So uh, I had three weeks straight of carfilzomib infusions and one and every other week of the Selenexor. So it, in the beginning, made me, well, they, they said it would make you nauseous. So they gave me two anti-nausea drugs while I was in the infusion getting the carfilzomib. And they also gave me two kinds of pills to take at home, one to take at night for three days and then one to take any other day that I felt nauseated. So it did usually pre present with some nausea for about three days really gave me a lot of fatigue, although it, we ended up finding out that the fatigue was actually due to the anti-nausea medicine that I was taking at night, or the extreme fatigue anyway. I still got fatigued, but after I stopped doing that, so we, we changed it. 
so I take three pills in the morning before I get my infusion and, and on cell and XR days. And then at five or six hours after I get my infusion, I take another dexamethasone and I didn't have any problems after that. So I think that's the thing. Give your body time. Talk to the, to the doctors and the nurses and ask them, you know, what to expect and what's normal. And f don't be afraid to ask them what's going on. Don't be afraid to, to say, what can I expect from this? What, um, what can I do maybe to, to change this? Can I change the dosage? Can I change um, the uh, timing I take it? You know, cause that's, that's another thing with dexamethasone. Sometimes it, depend, it depends on the time because it can keep you awake. So work with your body to know what is the time and if you can make adjustments. So just ask the doctor, what else can I do? And, and don't just tell them. So this, this is one mistake that I made in the beginning. I thought if I, just, if I said something to my doctor, they, they would like address it, but they don't always do that. If you just say something, they'll just listen and write it down. So you've got to specifically ask them. So I'm uh, like almost, well, I don't know, so 18 months, a little over 18 months. So I am very lucky. One thing I know that I'm very lucky is that I have responded to a lot of different treatments. Most of my treatments have been pretty good. Well, hmm. Maybe a quarter of them haven't worked, a third of them haven't worked, but the others have worked. So I've been very lucky that um, to have that percentage work for me. I mean, I've already discussed what probably my next treatments are going to be. I've got a choice between either a bite by specific antibody trial or um, there's apparently another kind of CAR T cell. Uh, clinical trial going on that that's a completely different target that might be a possibility. So I've got some possibilities down the road. Um, so it is likely that within some amount of time, three to six months maybe even, I'll probably have to go on another treatment. But I know Selenexor has worked for way longer than, than they expected and, and well tolerated. You know, I'm not ready to go yet. So <laughs> it, 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 it gives me hope that there's more out there. It gives me hope that so many people are working on it and that so many people are working at different levels to help us folks with myeloma be better taken care of and that they're totally looking for a cure. So that's very exciting and getting closer than they have ever been. When we got the diagnosis, he went on to explain it and okay, there are going to be treatments and stuff like that there. And then he said, as far as survival is concerned, five years is easy. And he said, we're, we're getting closer to 10. So, um, median was seven and a half years survival and she's beaten the hell out of that. So It's about survival, about doing the right things, getting support and um, being tough and I'm still here, damn it. <laughs>